very nice to see you, James or Jim. Um, I I understand you. You m most nobody calls you James. <laughs> no, not since early grades. <laughs> Uh, is that a thing in, uh, I, I know in a lot of countries like the, the like the Australia that, you know, something called, your name is Dick. You never called Dick. You called something else entirely. Yes. I had many nicknames. <laughs> That's why my last name Quintiri is hard to spell and hard to say. I think people trip over the last part. So when I was teaching the ATF guys, they labeled me Dr. Q and that that seemed to stick so other people used it too. I love it. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna call you Dr. Sounds, Q. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds good. Yeah. So what was your first? You were uh I mean it's such a big honor for me and I is so inspired by meeting you uh because I've read your work for so long time uh, on research really? reports and books. Uh, it's so, so cool. What's your background to be able to read that stuff? No, just a firefighter, but I'm a nerd in that sense. You know, I, a self-declared nerd. A firefighter. Yes, my I'm a firefighter, and I uh, started doing instruction, and I, you know, I, I went down the rabbit hole of of trying to understand why we do what we do, and, and that yeah. of course led me to fire science. Um, I'm not an engineer. I never had a. You didn't never, go to the University of Lund. No. I felt that as a waste of time because <laughs> now, really? yeah, I'm not really interested in the academic circle, you know, like the but academic any, side. Any of those students go into the fire service with uh, higher credentials, right? Yeah. That's yeah. And we have a, yeah, we have a, you know, what do you call it? Side direct entry to senior officers, but then you become a senior officer and that, that was not really what I wanted to do. Um, okay. I am a firefighter. I'm a fire instructor. You know, I, 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 I was a fire, you know, in the fire service until I quit and just be a fire instructor. I, I was an incident commander, so sort of a senior, senior officer, but I was still very operational and I, and I work with training. Um, and I felt to get a degree wouldn't serve my purpose, but the knowledge of getting a degree, that was highly interesting. So I've read all the books <laughs> and so on. That's sort fantastic. of. Uh, so I was just I, degree wasn't interesting, but the knowledge was. Yeah, you can yeah say that's that. pretty. That's, yeah, that's more important. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, it depends on what you want to do. Sometimes you have to have a degree to sort of get by, but but for me, it was that was not uh, important. Uh, but I want to go back a little bit in time for you because I don't know a lot about your history and so on, and I want to know sort of to start with, you know, why what made you or what was your path going into fire research or, or, or that fire aspect why why did you bite that bullet an accident i don't mean an accident uh, yeah, no. i had <laughs> personally it was I just mean, coincidence it's, it's a, you know our, we go down paths in life and a path emerges due to circumstances and i found myself uh, working at the national bureau of standards in uh, 1971 and they were starting a program or expanding their program in fire research and uh, not knowing anything about fire or even thinking about it uh, i had to dig in so what, what what was the role you had before that like why were you at nist well i was uh, i was mainly a student i mm -hmm. studied engineering I went to work for NASA for a bit, and I realized I didn't know enough, so I went back to graduate <laughs> school. And um, when I uh, graduate, graduated with a PhD, NASA wasn't hiring anymore. They were cutting back. Yeah. And so I looked for a job, and it was tough. I got a job in, in a corporation, and after one year, they reduced their laboratory. And I was, since I was just there, I was first to go. And I looked for a job and it was tough in around 1970. And uh, I, I got hired by National Bureau of Standards, who was beginning the program in fire. 
I had background in fluid mechanics and heat transfer and also buoyancy, which is key for fire. Yeah, absolutely. You, uh, you got to understand buoyancy to understand fire. So that, that led me into the door. Yeah. And it's interesting you mentioned fluid dynamics and, and buoyancy. I think that that's a, like two areas that the fire service has really, really been missing. Um, yes, I, but it's... Yeah, oh, absolutely. It's, but I think that we have had at least... It's not just the fire service. There are people that are scientists and still don't understand buoyancy. No, I Our think it is. I think that when I realized that there are no negative pressures and solely positive pressures, you know, linking to, you know, how density works and it's, you know, cold air is not being vacuumed in, it's just pushing in because it's heavier. Um, that broke a lot of mental models for me, which I had from my training as a firefighter, but <laughs> we can get back to that. But yes, it, I think that is a, a huge part of its lacking and also about how firefighter streams move air around and how you know the water droplets interact with the smoke there's also huge parts missing there generally uh, well if you want to visualize this in an educational uh, way you can take a fish tank with water and inside the fish tank put a plastic model of a room turn it upside down and uh, inject uh, dyed salt water in the top. Uh. The dyed salt water will fall down opposite to what smoke does. Yeah. And if you turn your camera up, upside down, what you will visualize or stand on your head, yeah. you will visualize is almost perfect smoke movement emulated by the water and the salt that's excellent i've actually seen uh when browsing around the internet um also experiments with uh, you know the colored water and heating heated water versus cold water when they do like for dams and stuff like that when you try to visualize uh, <clears throat> in other areas than firefighting and so on um so I know it's possible. I've never done it myself. Um, but it, you can do it with with salt water, and yeah. um, it, it's uh, and it works better. You mentioned FTS one time in an email. Yeah, it works better than FTS. I don't think FTS can fully predict it. I want to get into FTS later because yeah, yeah, we'll I talk, think we'll uh, talk. yeah. I think it is yeah, a I very mean, important scale, topic. Scale, scale modeling uh, goes a long, long way. Yeah, I love I love scale models. I mean, they have they they have their problems, but yes, I want to really get into that too. Now, going back, I want I want to I don't want I want to go back to. So you started NIST and started Fire Dynamics. Uh, I started working for NIST and Fire. What was the state of fire research then? What was sort of what was the kind of research sort of that you had to apply your knowledge to? Well, I would say that uh, most people in the U.S. were totally ignorant, including academics and scientists. There were a few maybe that had some background, like some people at NIST, or because NBS is now National Institute of Standards and Technology. Yeah. So NBS became NIST. Yeah. And and so there were people there, but it was really a few people. Uh, Maybe in the U.S., a couple of dozen uh, that had some connection to fire, but the field wasn't developed. However, if you went to Europe, and it's particularly England, England had a really fantastic laboratory, the Fire Research Station, which was part of the building research establishment. And they did super work and documented it in reports. Those reports are still available online through uh, IAFSS, the International Association of Fire Safety Science. Uh, so th they had good knowledge. In addition, the Japanese 
had good knowledge and good science. Uh, they had two laboratories there. And it wasn't just because of World War II. It goes back because most of their houses were wood. And they had more like Sweden. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but not exactly. You got heavy timber and stuff. They got a lot of lightweight mm -hmm. stuff in their houses. So uh, they had to be cognizant of fire. And so those two places, Japan and the UK, uh, were sources of information. Uh, and uh, the program at NBS and NIST uh, began to congeal around 1971 because of many forces. And as that program developed over the years, it interacted with Japan and the UK. And we formed a, really quite a, a good uh, a discourse. In fact, I mentioned the IAFSS, International Association of Fire Safety Science. The 14th symposium was in Japan just uh, last week. And uh, that whole thing was founded based on the need for an international discourse and stimulation about fire research. So it's, it's still going forward. And, uh, and that's, that was the, the state of the art in 1971 was meager uh, in the US. Is it correct to say that that combustion was well known, sort of well understood, but fire in yeah. buildings? So that's what we're talking about, right? Yes. And in fact, when fire research started to uh, seep into the combustion uh, world, it was looked down upon. Yeah. Because it was but too many variables, too unscientific or sort of, or yeah. what was the... It, well, it, it didn't fit. It was, yes, the question was, you know, where's the science? Yeah. However, in the 1971, the National Science Foundation in the U.S. funded a program called Research for National Needs. People were more liberal back then. Uh, a lot of, you know, safety items emerged uh, in cars, yeah. and a lot of attention to fire safety arose. And so the NSF created this program for research and national needs, and a portion of that was fire. So they had $2 million in 70, 70, 71. You could extrapolate that to today. Yeah, it's a I'm sure amount. that's more than ten million dollars today. Yeah, it's probably more. And, yeah. uh, maybe more than that, more than that. Yeah. Uh, and so they could get a twenty to thirty um, grants in that program, and they attracted top scientists in the U.S. Top scientists, and so that was the real stimulus. Those scientists, other than like a new guy like me, you know, brought, yeah. wanted to go to the higher level. And um, people in uh, NBS at the time, they were scientists too. And we integrated with them and we learned, each of us learned. Some of them made really stupid mistakes because they, you know, because fire is... You know, when you say rocket science <laughs> is, uh, you know, use that cliche, yeah. uh, fire uh, is more complicated than rocket science. There's a lot so, of variables. So you, had to, you had to really dig in and sort through. And so in the 70s and early 80s, a lot of advances were made, and they were made collectively between the British and the U.S. and people at Lund University, uh, and I think SP had their lab at that time. Yeah. And so uh, that's what arose. That, so what? Uh, then 
then Ronald Reagan in 82, or whatever it was, wanted to kill the fire program and also the US Fire Administration because it dealt with regulations. Uh, he wanted to deregulate a lot of stuff? Yes, like Margaret Thatcher. Yeah, yeah. In fact, Margaret Thatcher probably indirectly called, caused Grenville. Yeah, by deregulating the fire safety uh, standards. Instead of, instead of giving it over to engineers to yeah. decide rather than pass the test for the yeah. sod material. Yeah, there's a, I guess there's a, the, 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 the discussion about performance based versus, you know, code based has always been going back yes, and forth. There, there's not a, there's not a enough um, information on performance based, the performance based process. You, yeah. you can have a, a kind of a template or a, an outline. But then you have to have uh, some tools available. And if you're going to deal with materials in fire, performance-based people are going to turn to test methods. Yeah. And those test methods differ all around the world. So you don't get engineering data from the test methods. No. In I'm fact, FDS... They would have to put the fire in FDS by knowing its energy release rate. Yeah. Yeah, You'll I think that that's the problem with FDS a lot of times. When I started realizing how much you have to assume to do your calculation, I thought that was, a, that was sort of a deal breaker for me. Yeah, yes, because, I mean, it's a good thing. We could talk oh, more oh, about that. Oh, absolutely. But, but, but uh, uh, I lost my train of thought. Bring, put me back on track. No, it's a, because a performance base is so hard to create data to sort of compare, and you have to put it sort of into FTS to. Yes, and and then who's going to regulate? You still need to regulate performance based processes. Yeah. Who's going to sign off on it? Yeah, I mean, the, usually it's the manufacturer who signs off of it. Sort of like I yeah, I yeah. think my stuff is is safe. <laughs> yes, you see. If we talk about the fire service de deeply, fire prevention and fire regulations should be a big part of what the fire service does. Yeah. They, they, they cannot just put out fires. They, they need to deal with the, uh, the engineering and science of fire and apply that so that they can do better prevention. I mean, in places like the U.S., that, that those selection of codes, it's on a local basis. Yeah. In Sweden, it's on a national basis. Uh, but to be fair, Sweden, see, Sweden is US, like a large city you, in the U.S. You see why the U.S. <laughs> is so screwed up. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I definitely. And, and I think, uh, I, I'm, uh, again, I want to get back to FTS and so on. Yeah, uh, on. But, yeah, but performance-based... Um, uh, and all those things, I think they're, uh, you know, in, in a world of, of where money is not the driving fo factor behind building stuff, uh, it might work. Uh, it might work better. It can, it, it can uh, work. It does work. Yeah. Uh, but you, you, someone has to be the judge of whether it was done right. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, so there, there has to be a check in that someplace, not just you're an engineer, you did the performance code uh, process. Okay. We believe you. Yeah. And I also think there's, I, I, I see a change that like, this is not the area I really want to talk about, but it's so interesting too. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. The, when you see performance based, a lot of times you're, you look at specific materials, but they're not put in the context of a structure, like, like a system, like in cladding, for instance, how, how big of an impact the distance between the cladding and the, and the building itself is and sort of the air gap and so on. So usually a lot of materials are tested as an individual piece, not in a system where you put it in a building. And that, of course, also plays huge problems with performance-based systems when they're not tested in the way they actually you know, are attached to the building. Yeah, but basically, you know, if you have paper on gypsum board, you don't just test paper. No. You test the gypsum board with the paper on it. Yeah. 
So you, the test methods are really product tests. Yeah. But the data from those tests can be engineering data if it's if it's formulated correctly. Yeah. No, I think that this is really interesting, <laughs> but uh, what, and we might get back to it, but I want to get to more yeah, yeah. basic well, stuff, you, which is basically, you, what, what? When, what, because when you, when you started doing research back then, sort of, uh, I mean, was it like start starting sort of a single fire in a room? Like what is actually happening if we put a, you know, a sofa on fire in a corner? That was basically what you started trying to understand or starting to quantify and so on. Yes, because in the 70s in the U.S., several things were striving in. The fire service perceived that fires were burning more quickly. Yeah. And it was probably due to the introduction of plastics over wool and cotton and things things like that yeah so plastics you know have a wide range of properties but some of them perform very poorly in a fire situation and there were fires in rooms that were catastrophic you know in particular due to a certain plastic and so the attention was how did, how does fire grow in a room and what the heck is flashover? Yeah. And at that time, they said, forget about the fully involved fire that attacks the structure. We solved that over the previous 50 years. Okay. So the intention was taken away from structures. Okay. And brought to the materials in a room and how they behaved. Yeah, so the, like the, 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 when you mean fully developed, you mean, you know, the entire bur- building is burning. Yeah, yes. yes, and maybe smoke movement through a building, and then toxicity arose yeah. as a, a, an issue. But the structural fire was pushed into the background. Yeah. I just wanted you to realize that where now it's coming more to the forefront because those people have, have neglected fire. Yeah, uh, it. Uh, you mean in the context of sort of building wooden high-rise buildings and stuff like that, or you mean by just by losing the knowledge of of, of the World Trade Center, uh, all of them? Yeah. Uh, if you're a structural engineer, you can design a bridge with a composite plastic that maybe has hollow voids in it. Yeah. And how do you do that? You test it in a tensile machine and you get some data and you turn it into engineering useful properties and you use your same formulas for, you know, modulus of elasticity and yield stress. And you design the whole building now out of this hollow plastic. Yeah. Well, they can do that. But what if the hollow, hollow plastic can burn? Then they don't know. We don't know how to deal with that. So the structural engineers, when they do their thing, they do it very well. If they make a mistake, the building falls down. Yeah. If you do the same thing in fire, you may not have a fire in that building for 100 years. So you're, you're going to be viewed as doing a great job because you won't live that long. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why, you know, fire doesn't get the attention until there's a real, real tragedy. Yeah. So, yeah. So room and content fire was sort of the things you wanted to look at. And you mentioned sort of like, say, like flashover. Flashover was a motivator. Smoke movement was a motivator. And when you looked at fire in a room, uh, you can see many phenomena as part of that room. You could see the flame, you could see its height, you could see how it interacts with the wall, how it interacts with the ceiling, it forms a jet on the ceiling, flow goes out the windows, so you can look at each of those pieces independently. 
and develop science from each one. Yeah. And then put it together, either conceptually in your head or in a system computer model, which people did. So those the early study of fire was studying phenomena, specific phenomena. How does a fire entrain air? How do you calculate the entrainment rate? What causes it to happen? What role does turbulence play? That was the focus. So what was, do you think, was there any, was there any big misconception, sort of like how a flashover occurs? Was there big misconceptions sort of in the, in the if, early if look, 70s? If you look at, in the early days, we would see fire and we would say, holy cow, look what happened so quickly. And what was the temperature before that happened? Yeah. And we said, oh, it's about 500 degrees Celsius. Oh, that might be the trigger for flashover. So things like that came up. They were not arbitrary, but they were just rough, you know, benchmarks yeah. from observation. And so people now today literally say, if you get 500 degrees, you have flashover or something like that. Yeah. Uh, if the flame comes out of the window, you might have flashover. They, they, however, again, if you go and look at the behavior of fire in a room, you find that it's unstable. And flashover is the jump in the instability that takes the fire from one realm to another realm. And that happens, you know, in seconds. And there's some people who studied that. And basically, flashover is an instability. And so it, it, it can't be just pinpointed. If you get this temperature, you got flashover. If a lawyer is questioning you on yeah. the stand, well, it, it didn't get to that temperature. That room didn't go to flashover. I mean... It, yeah, because you have all these definitions. You have, sorry to yes, say, if, if there's... In fact, one fire investigator collected all of them and said, what does this mean? And I've written on the subject, and Phil Thomas has written on the subject. UJ Hasemi from Japan has written on the subject. It's an instability. But maybe it's too tricky or too advanced to study. So very few people look at that. Yeah, and also, now, and, you, and, I mean, you could use FDS to pinpoint flashover if if you don't put in the fire, if the room conditions are causing the fire to grow. If you have a fire growth model in FDS. Interaction with the smoke layer, you could unravel F the FDS to show how these instabilities are occurring. So it, people have lost sight of that, and uh, when they jump to FDS, they say we don't have to calculate the flame height anymore. FDS does that. We don't have to calculate the heat transfer to the ceiling in a ceiling jet. FDS does that. What they don't know is FDS has weaknesses and can't do this all. I know I started again, we're getting jumping to FDS, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I started yes. because I, when yeah. I, yeah. for instance, one of the reasons I wanted to use FDS back, back in some days was to, to create uh, visual models for firefighters to understand fire. So it was just a way of simulating a fire. It's a good teach. It's an excellent teaching tool. Yes. So I started, and that's where I started sort of struggling when I talked to people, because I couldn't run the FDS simulations myself. I didn't want to get into how, how actually understanding how to run. So I, I, I got people to do it for me. Yeah, but then they were yes. coming all, back with all these questions, like how, you know, what, what's, what are all the assumptions I had to make sort of, you know, what kind of assumptions do you want to have for, for doing it? And I was going like, but couldn't the, the, the software do that? No, you have to do all these assumptions about the heat release rate, about the radiant feedback from the walls. You have to make all these assumptions that now you can simulate a fire and maybe it will look like 
the fire you are intending. Otherwise, we have to tweak the variables. But that is also why I think fire for me, when I became a fire instructor, I wanted to learn. I started reading more and more and more. I just got more and more confused. <laughs> I was sort of when I started because it there was so many contradictions because I was jumping from firefighter literature, which is sort of, you know, it's more or less simplified and sometimes bastardized um, concepts from some science, you know, because to make it them understandable, you know, simplify them, but also they they get ruined in that process more or less. Uh, and I started to unravel those and jumping to science. I, I, I ended up with the same uh, confusion. Because there were so many different, like you said, you know, just a sim- simple thing from the outside, the definition for a flashover. And you go, oh, it's 20 kilowatts of square meter. It's uh, it's 600 degrees in smoke layer. It's, uh, you know, it's a it's a change from, you know, fuel control to ventilation control. Or it's the it's the local fire to, uh, uh, you know, basically uh, an all, all-encompassing fire. And all those things, when you pick them apart, are very hard to define in themselves. Yeah. You know, where... They all- they all do happen and they happen around the flashover. Yeah. And certainly flashover is a transition between uh, fuel control where you have enough oxygen and ventilation limited. Yeah. It is, it is that. But it, it can be triggered at a lower temperature or a higher temperature depending upon other variables. So that's why it it has to be looked at as an instability but the end of the instability is the fully developed fire and the fully developed fire is you're either burning all the fuel in the room or all the air that comes in so if you jump to that state then you could say you've gone through flashover but where was the trigger you would have to look at it a little with a finer tool yeah i mean you all because now if you have a larger room you it will look very different if you have a lot like a long room it would look vastly different course like a normal room because the the progression the flashover won't happen at the same time anymore it would sort of happen you call the traveling fire so today i guess and so on i, I you know you're shaking your head but it, it is uh, you, keep that mind. Whoever invented traveling fires didn't fully understand fire behavior. Well, uh, because those yeah. same people now specify. Oh, no. No, you, you froze. Let's hope you get back. I said the wrong thing, maybe. Yeah, yeah, get back to it. Yeah. The people, the people who, who said traveling fires don't understand what. They, when they consider them in a structural context or structural fire uh, effects, they specify the speed of the traveling fire. Yeah. They don't calculate it from first principles. They just assume that it's uh, a certain speed, or, or how do you mean? Yes. Yes. Read, it, read the literature carefully. <laughs> when you have a long, a big space, and by the way, the fire investigators know this already. If you have a fire in a room, typical room, yeah, and it's away from the opening, fire will grow and you'll get to a point of flashover. And now there will not the, the air that comes in gets contaminated and can't reach that fire in the back. So the fuel that's being produced, which is an excess in fuel, has to find the air, and the fire jumps to the vent. Yeah. Investigators in the past would say, I saw fire in the back of the room. I saw fire damage at the vent. It must have been two fires. Yeah. And we have arson. Yeah. But no, that's a phenomenon yeah. of flashover now jumping to the ventilation control state. And the fire now, the flames are now at the door. And if you go back in the room, there's no more flames. No. Now, you can see this if you put little cameras in your room. 
I don't know if you've done that. Yeah, of course. And, and with models, it's very good because you can see different spaces. You can see with the glass window, for instance, it's very easy to see. So we do the students. You you do compartment fire studies with glass windows? No, not studies, training. Like the, you, you know, we do scale models with training and do it for just two compartments. And then you see the progression, you see the flames move towards the inlet. And you see behind the flames, zero, zero flames, a dark box. In the flame with the gas burner? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So you put too much gas in and it jumps to the vent. Yeah. But I, I also do it. Yeah. That's a traveling fire. Yeah. No, exactly. But but it's more, th it's more than that. I'll explain it yeah, yeah. more. For you have a big space. Yeah. Like a plan office building space. And. <clears throat> You reach the condition where the air that's coming in is now all consumed so that the smoke going out has zero oxygen. Okay? Yeah, yeah. At that point, you can only burn so much fuel. You can't burn the entire room. So you burn that fuel. Then it moves to the next piece. Then you burn that piece and it moves to the next piece. Then you burn that and it moves to the next piece. It's now this is a surface spread. It's yeah. not the gas phase going to the vent. This is a surface spread because you can't burn all the fuel in the room at the same time. Yeah. It has to progress. So that is what a traveling fire is. And to predict it, you would have to predict how fast this burns and how fast it can spread to the next piece. Yeah. If you can't do that, you can't predict the traveling fire. Yeah, and that's going to be highly dependent on the geometry yes, of and the that's fuel. Why yeah. When you have a fire in a big building and it becomes fully developed, it can last for one, two, or even three hours. Yeah. Because you have so much stuff in there to burn, yeah. but the windows are small, and it just takes a long time for all that fuel to eventually have enough air to burn. And that's why fully developed fires are one to three hours long, and that's why structural fire behavior has to uh, deal with that. But as soon as you say, um, and they saw this by watching FDS or something, but it was a prescribed fire. I mean, it. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to say anything. <laughs> but how much do you think it? Because we we want to create. I mean, that's a big part of what I do. I try to translate knowledge into mental models that are simple enough for fire. If I just understand, and that requires simplification. So we have a mental model of fire, of fire, you know, flashovers in a small compartment. So, you know, typically we have a mental model says, you know, you know, something goes, it's a localized fire in the corner, you know, start building. Here, make, yeah. make a scale model of a long room. Yeah. And put pans of liquid in the room, separate it. Yeah. And have a window only at one end. Yeah. Light the fire back here. As it becomes ventilation limited, the fire will jump to the vent. Yeah. Fire will be out back there. And then you will watch the fire go from pan to pan to pan to pan. That's the traveling fire. And you would say that the flashover happened in that case before, or would you say the flashover happened when all the pans had started? Well, basically, if it, the flashover would would start when there is a noticeable instability jump, and so if you were modern. If you were moder model uh, measuring the temperatures in the room, all right, what you would see is that the temperature will rise, and then suddenly you get to a point where it goes like this, and then it steadies out again. 
When it goes like this, it takes a little time, then steadies out. Flashover is that transition. When it was triggered to go up, that's the onset of flashover. When it levels off again, you've reached the fully developed fire. So in that scenario, you would say the flashover is when the basic fire jumps, and it's going to be before it jumps to the burning in the it, inlet? It actually, it actually, if you were measuring oxygen at the same time, you would see the oxygen going down slowly, mm -hmm. and then suddenly it would drop. And then if it reaches a ventilation limited state, it would go to zero. And then after that, you would have the traveling surface fire, basically. And, and, and then if you have more fuel in that room, you will see the traveling fire. Yeah. And, and, and then structural people say, at, of course, at those flames, you have a more severe fire condition, one might think. But in the structural fire that lasts for an hour or longer, the walls have become almost fully adiabatic because the walls are made of insulators. Yeah. So you lose very, very little heat to the walls and the ceiling. So when the gases leave the flame and they move, they're not going to lose temperature that much. Yeah. So this temperature in this whole space is going to be about the same as the flame temperatures. So it's not more severe. The smoke is heating up everything. Yeah. It, yeah. And, and, and not just from a convective point of view, but by radiation. When this stuff here gets hot and radiates to the floor, it radiates back to the ceiling too. Yeah. So when you get to the fully developed fire, you have a uniform, a fairly uniform furnace. And that can go on for, like you say, hours if, if there's just people, enough fuel. People in the old days said, we only need one temperature to characterize this. Yeah. People are saying that's wrong now. Because saying of, the, yeah. it's our own. Because they want it to be, to quantify it sort of as a traveling flashover yeah. where. You have yes. parts of the parts of that yes. room would be individual hot, but it would cool down somewhere else. Uh, we're, you asked me how fire began, and yeah. people look different pieces. Yeah, people are not looking. They they might see something and tweak it out, but they're not looking at pieces to say, "Do we really know how that happens? Do I really know how the hot gases heat the ceiling?" I say, of course we do. We run FDS, and it tells us. Yeah, but that's a that's a that's a. <laughs> someone wrote the algorithm for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. And 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 <clears throat> fire in a room is basically frictionless. The gases flow in a mostly frictionless way until they get near surfaces. Yeah. So FDS is based on a computer model for fluid mechanics that says it's basically frictionless. And they artificially have to put some friction in there. Otherwise, the equations will become unstable. However, when you get near a wall or a ceiling, you have to make some adjustments. And FDS tries to do that in a very empirical way, but not in a rigorous way. If they did, they would take up too much a grid space. So would that impact how the convection is transferred to the walls? Yes. Convective heat? Yes. Yes. Now, radiation might work okay. Yeah. But if they say they can predict uh, uh, soot production, that would be another question. Because if they change the amount of soot they're producing, they get a different result. But the material has to tell you, you know, how much soot you're producing.
Yeah, the yield per at that that yeah, yes, a yield, yield, but but you know, look around the room. You got different fuels. Yeah, yeah, I know it's a mess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so in in other words, FDS does great for what it can do. It it's uh, I mean, the guy that invented FDS is a good friend of mine. Yeah. Uh, Kevin McGrattan at NIST is a good shepherd and turned it loose. But it has to be turned loose to people that ha have enough knowledge to use to understand what's there and what's not and what you can use. As you said, an educational tool, yes, you could look at the graphics, they're amazing, and you could teach people about fire through them. Yeah. Yes, and you can learn stuff yourself by running it in a scientific way. So it, it's it's a great thing, but someone has to understand its limitations. I I went to a a, a conference one time, which was the users of FDS, and the NIST people were there. Yeah. And when they saw what some of the users were doing with FDS. They cringed. Were they trying to sort of prove things, make predictions with FDS? They were trying to do performance-based codes yeah. with FDS. Yeah, you've seen, that's, now, you've seen yeah. now the hazard. There's good and yeah. bad here. Yeah, I, I started realizing that again when I when I started wanted using education, and then I looked at at sort of um, case evaluations. Um, you know, you look at fires that happened and sort of using FTS to recreate the fire behavior. And that's where I, I saw a sort of uh, definitely a value in it when you try to recreate something to understand it's sort of like one aspect of it. But also, you know, I read some of the studies and I thought like this is, they're basically just making a lot of guesses here and trying trying to see if they can guess enough to make it sort of match whatever the let's say the firefighters reported what they saw i i think what kevin McGrattan had in his mind when he opened it up because the original guy wanted to make it rigorous step by step when kevin opened it up he said let's make this a tool and people will fix it as it grows yeah but i think there's more users of it than fixers of it might be true. I'm one of those. <laughs> At least I tried yeah. to be. Yeah. And look, I know people that use it and I've used it myself for, you know, basic needs that I wanted to get more. So it, it's, it can be a great, great tool. And, it, it, you know, give, give, give them credit for putting it out. Oh, there. for sure. I think it's, yeah. it, it's, but it should stimulate more than just be used. It's it's like most things. It's uh, every tool can be used for good and for bad, and I guess that's the same with FDS. Yeah, well, see, the NIST program has atrophied because of the Reagan years, uh, and those people don't they don't have enough resources, and fire research in the U.S. is really meager compared to what it is like in Europe. Fire research is much more active in Europe. Yeah, I, at least uh, I understand it to be the case. Now, my I'm skewed also because I look at fire fire research very limited to, at least most of what I look at is fire research that that is actually usable for firefighting, um, and that has really invigorated in the United States with the uh, with UL uh, picking up the gold. The UL people, they're they. they could really make a breakthrough. Madrikowski, yeah, Steve Gerber, yeah. What they're doing at UL is what NIST should have done. Yeah. So they're they're overshadowing NIST, and they're trying to bring more science and engineering to the fire service. Uh, yes, I, I I commend those people. Yeah, but I know they get a lot of flack from other researchers because it's still unscientific. Um, uh, look, there's a learning curve. They're hired brand new people, even though they're PhDs, they have to acclimate. 
and they have to grow. Yeah, but it's uh, also I, like almost impossible to do fire research with so many variables. Um, because oh, you could we thought in, 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 no. Yeah, but you could reduce the amount of variables, but they would the speed of the research would take forever. Sort of so you, you jump a little uh, bit maybe too fast. We're still learning about the universe. Oh, for sure, for sure. <laughs> yes. And Faraday said, you know, in the candle flame, you have almost all the physics and chemistry of the universe. Yeah. So, you know, yes, uh, just like people will be studying fluid mechanics, yeah. but those that study fluid mechanics and design airplanes do not throw out their wind tunnel. No. By the way, before I shit, they, you're... They don't. They don't yeah. just believe in the computer model. Before the I people forget. who design ships do not throw out their tow tank with water in it. Yeah. Uh, gravity is just a theory too, but it seems solid. Uh, <laughs> you know, gravity is not fully understand, but it seems to work anyway. Uh, before I forget it, when you mentioned the candles, yeah, yeah. Your, 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 your educational series on, uh, I think it was, the, um, what is called in America, the Fire Investigators website. You made a, a, an educational series, I think it's for fire, uh, fire investigators. Yes, the uh, IAAI. Maybe. The uh, International this, Association of Arson Investigators. Yeah, that's might be, you know, that was one, uh, you know. Of, uh, they, they were stimulated by the ATF, who um, got the responsibility of fire investigation in the 80s. Yeah. And we went to one of their fires, a big fire. And while we sat there, we analyzed it and told them what we thought happened. And then they said, how are these people doing this? And then some of them wanted to learn. So, and and then the organization, the IAAI, which was, if you go back, was almost anti-science, yeah. picked it up. So that's one of the few bright spots where people are looking for a scientific method to help them. No, that educational series on the candles was one of those things. First one that, you know, you were very good at, you're, you're an excellent storyteller and, of course, no fire, but you're also very good at conveying that you, message. You looked at the candle, right? Yeah. Yeah, but they have a whole bunch of other yeah, things. No, no, I, saw, I, I saw probably everything that was available on their website, at yeah. least, that you could get in my hands on. But the candle was sort of the, I love, I really love this the simplicity of a candle, of course, uh, going back to to the candle uh, in the UK. Um, but, you know, but you know who stimulated me on that? I knew about Faraday. Yeah. But there was an ATF agent that got me involved in the Waco case, Branch Davidian fire. Yeah. And he would go home every night and play with the candle. And he inspired me so that I... I started doing things, and I started to see all, all that you could do yeah. uh, with the candle and how much you could learn from that. It's it's really quite amazing. Oh, it's tremendous. Yeah. And and again, I love the, the simplicity. As a fire instructor, I always struggled and still struggle with the limitations you have in time and resources to do training. And uh, I'm still amazed today that what you can use in training just to simply ask, you know, why is the candle hollow? And you show it with a mesh and people go like, Poof. Yeah, but well, to, sci to scientists too. Yeah. I mean, it helps. So, you know, again, you look at the thickness of the flame. Yeah. It's a millimeter. It's, it's so FDS tiny. Yes, it's predicting that, but you put in a grid of two inches. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, and I, I um, yeah, you froze, but... No, I think I think it's just amazing. Uh, but but it goes back to the understanding of. I remember I went to America the first time uh, doing fire. Uh, so I went to do ride alongs with with American fire departments. Um, this was um, 
about 15 years ago, I think. So I was, I was, uh, I was just going around because I, you know, I didn't have a family. I loved fire, just going to America to ride fire trucks for a month. And I realized that the average level of fire, understanding fire was uh, basically zero. No understanding whatsoever. Um, they, they didn't right. understand the words at all because I was brought up, Sweden had a, but the fire service always, always, I would say, but especially since the seventies and eighties where, when we had to fire science engineers who joined the fire service and sort of, you know, really made fire science to firefighters understandable. Um, so we had, when I went there, I had a, you know, pretty strong foundation of fire science. I would say it's gotten a lot better and so on, but it was, you know, on that level, you know, I really understood what a, you know, oxygen limited fire was and so on. But when I went to America, they had zero understanding of that. They they they, they didn't use the words, and they were struggling with with making the world make sense because, like, of course, they, they could be experienced firefighters been working for fifteen years and they knew what happened, but they didn't have any words to describe it. They didn't have, uh, sort of, and that ma- that made it hard for them to make predictions. It made them hard. It, it became more of a when this happens, something else usually happens. So you sort of have us try to make predictions, but you only see a sliver when you're sitting in the hallway and maybe you see flames rolling in the ceiling. You only see a certain aspect and, and it's very hard to 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 bridge that gap towards when you're sitting in the wider right. hallway or a great room because it you know now I have flames in the ceiling too, but it doesn't behave the same way. Why? Um, so I think that 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 what has been happening in America is really fun because I think the fire science is reaching down to firefighters more than it has before, and I think the UL and 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 NIST before that uh, also uh, has made a huge benefit of doing that. But I want to go back to before we get back here again to at some point you decided to start writing the book Enclosure Fires. When was the when you when did you start to with Carlson. Yeah, with Carlson, yeah. Yes. At which point did you think about starting writing books? Because that's a sort of a different thing than writing, you know, doing research and so on. Now you at some point wanted to educate people, right? Well, I, I was at NIST for 20 years. And I became a division chief, one of the two divisions in the fire program. And... Uh, the management was almost non-scientific, and that was frustrating. And I had visualized or witnessed the development of fire signs for 20 years at NIST. And I said, someone needs to write this down. Now, Dave Lucht, who was teaching, who was head of the program at Worcester Polytechnic Institute for Fire Master's Program wanted Phil Thomas to write a book. I don't know if you know Phil Thomas, but... No. Phil, I've Phil seen, is, seen, uh, seen the name on papers and other places. He, but. he worked on everything you could think of in fire before anyone else. Okay. So Dave Luck asked Philip to write it. And Philip went back and saw Drysdale and says, look, they want me to go there and stay there for six months to a year and teach a course and write a book. Phil said, I I can't do that at my age. So he sent Drysdale. Okay. So Drysdale wrote his book. Yeah. And not to take away from Drysdale's book, but I said, that's not the kind of book I think is needed. You. I grew up in heat transfer and fluid mechanics, and those texts, they develop a theory and show you how something came about. So if you got a formula in the end, you saw the path of the theory taking you to that formula. Yeah. And so you could see, you know, it didn't just pop up into thin air. And so I wanted to write a book in that mold. And, and, Dry, because, and Drysdale's book is more about, you know, it's very technical well, about the... Drysdale's book is more, this is what happens and yeah. this is what you get. Yeah. And I talked to Drysdale one time and I said, I want to explain to the student how we got there. 
And he said, that's the student's job. <laughs> but, yeah, but then you, you, know, you ask a lot about the students. But, but we had a, this, you know, he's a friend of mine. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I said, I don't, I'm fed up at NIST. I want to go to the university and teach and write a book. So w once you go to the university and start teaching as an instructor, you know, it takes a lot of time yeah. to teach courses. And so, you know, I wasn't just teaching a fire course. I was teaching other courses and um, I was developing my book material, but it took years. In the meantime, Carl Carlson comes to visit and says he wants to write a book with me. And I said, okay, but I don't want you to write a book about fire. You could write a book about what fire does all around and how the smoke moves and, you know, and maybe the flame height. But, you know, I'm trying to develop this book based on combustion. And, and so I'm going to write that book, but I'll help you with your book. So we collaborated and. Carlson took most of the effort. Uh, indeed, he wrote most of the book. I wrote a couple of chapters. And uh, recently, he just got a, uh, a second edition out through the help of someone from Lund. So that, that's how that book came about. It was in the late 1990s. And Drysdale's book came out earlier, I think. It might have come out even in the 1980s. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember. I, I don't remember looking at the dates of. The, I wasn't born sort of then, but <laughs> eighty three. I wasn't. You I was. Missed a, you missed a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I understand. Um, but um, no, it, it, because exactly as you point out to me, a dry still is a great reference. Uh, I read it, but I, I, you know, since I'm not an engineer and I'm not really interested in the engineering stuff, the the, the formulas. I am interested in how exactly what you specified. I want to understand fire um, from a conceptual side. I want to sort of because that's how I think. I don't think in in formulas. I'm not a. I don't like math. I think in concepts and mental models, and I want the mental models to stick together to form like a sort of a, a cohesion, like a, a picture of how the world works. And th think of what you said earlier about the firefighters seeing phenomena and conceptualizing things in their head. Yeah. And if they only had some science behind it, it would enrich their lives. Oh, for sure. And perfection. Yeah. But it is, I mean, we have, again, there's, there's so many steps we have. So enclosure fires, I think was one of the things now, uh, it, it led to a lot of spinoffs in, in publications around the world in terms of just like firefighter training books and so on. And, and it, it heavily influenced uh, fire training manuals in Sweden of how to explain fires and so on. So it was hugely influential, I think. Um, I mean, I find myself, you know, going back to history because I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't the firefighter in the in the nineties. I, you know, I started in two thousand four. Um, so I'm backtracking to understand where things came from. That's that's what I'm doing, uh, because I need that to sort of you mentioned first principle. I think, think about that more and more and more because there's so many. I I, I reach dead ends, or things you know go like, where does this come from? And people can't explain it. Go like, it's just a dead end. We don't know where it came from, and it's not, it's not. You can't track it back to a source or something. Um, so enclosure fires was the, one of the books that for me sort of started putting those concepts. You know, very uh, outlined those concepts where are things coming from. So that's uh, hugely important. Now, when I think about fire, uh, again, I have all those mental models. I'm trying to fit them together. Uh, now, I try to take them you know, one step further. And, and there's always been, at least to my perception, uh, a huge gap with translating science to practitioners. And maybe that's for every field, but in you know fire science, that was sort of bridging a, a little bit of more of a step from calculations to concepts, sort of explaining how a fire dynamic work. But what to, from concept to what do we actually do about it? That's another step, and I think that's one of the reasons where I saw my purpose was sort of to to try to bridge those gaps between 
those concepts <clears throat> and what to do. But again, like I told before, what I met with was a lot of confusions because there were so many concepts and hard to sort of know what to do with them because as soon as you start messing with sort of, you know, spraying water on something, right? like I tried to FDS, what happens if I spray water? I realized FDS can't really handle like water. <laughs> if you start suppression, you know, that's, that, that's where it really breaks down in actually making, you know, uh, predictions of what's going to happen. Uh, so it, it felt like there was a huge, there was a huge black hole for me in terms of relating sort of firefighting practice to actual under, you know the fire development <coughs> did you when you start looking at fire and fire research and compartment fires did at any point you know fire fighting start to come into picture when you start doing research or was that sort of when i when i started at nist there were three fire programs one dealing with structures one dealing with flammable fabrics and a new program trying to help the fire service. They all got combined into one center. The director of that center actually rose to being the head of all of NBS. So he was a good guy. Yeah. Uh, but what got lost in it was the fire service piece. Because politically, it touched on the issue of how best to fight a fire yeah. and things like that. And you, you know in the fire service, they have different ideas. Yeah. And even Madrikowski was asking me several months back what happened to that early research because there was a guy working on you know, better turnout coats and helmets and all of that. Yeah. And so that program died. And I, I'm glad to see that those guys uh, picked it up. So, uh, but reaching reaching people like that and educating them, it, it's, a, it's a tough hole because some of them, you, you know, I, I wrote this a book that is digested from my higher level book that you know i wrote later principles of fire what, or principles of, of fire behavior all right and that was aimed at the practitioner primarily firefighters and uh fire investigators now maybe 10 percent um you know will grab it but the other 90 percent are afraid of the algebra in it and I tried to just keep it to algebra. I even in the second edition, I put in an appendix to explain algebra. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's a big stumbling block. But on the other side of that, you know, I realized the value of listening to fire investigators tell me stories and then understanding you know, bringing the science into the story. And it, it, it you know, I, I mean, you asked me about flashover. I, I gave a, a seminar at one of those IAAI meetings on flashover. Uh, I don't know, about three or four years ago. Uh, and it was based on visuals and data and concepts. And it was on the instability. You know, but but explaining that in general, it's not widely accepted. But the but the investigators enabled me to see some of that because they do experiments and they do really fine experiments and they look inside the room with cameras. And when you when you have all of that good data where you could look inside the room under the smoke layer. Yeah. You can see what's going on inside with the fire and then all the instruments that they have. I mean, I don't know if you ever visited the ATF lab, but that lab grew out of our connection. No, I never had the fortune. I've only been to UL in Maryland, for instance, but... but uh... Well, it's, 
it's right next to it. Yeah, but maybe I didn't know anyone in ATF that let me in. <laughs> they would have let you in. They, they, no. You're from Sweden, not China. <laughs> no, they, so, they, they had a China. To tell you how things have changed, yeah. back in the early 2000s, they had a Chinese guest worker from one of the Chinese uh, 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 universities yeah. uh, as a guest worker at NIST, as well as at the ATF lab. <clears throat> yeah, that maybe that's not happening anymore. It, for you, it could happen. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, I hope uh, I hope Sweden is not a big threat to the United States. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, but UL, those those guys, UL, they want to build a big laboratory like that. Yeah, they wanna, they wanna, they okay, wanna, they, said, they wanna they really expand. All, yeah, they wanna expand over the, over the world. Um, you know, and, and I'm happy. You know, I'm really a, a little bit afraid. Uh, afraid was the, the wrong word. I'm a little bit uh, cautious about UL because they're growing so big in the fire service research that it's sort of a monopoly. Um, and the monopolies are never good, even if it's knowledge based. You kind of sort of run the risk of of uh, of um, you know finding a path, and that path take you maybe astray or something. So the uh, I'm glad that the, the the Dutch people are doing you know good fire research. Just a little bit of UK I see. Um, uh, Sweden is not in the forefront. You know, too much, too little money. Um, uh, but there are some that do fire research. Uh, the poles, you know, that some of the you know. That then started doing great research, I think. Tokyo um, Fire Department does research. Yeah, but it's they. I, I, you know, maybe they're not good at communicating it to me. Uh, no, not, <laughs> they're not. Good. Yeah, um, and it's still no society in terms of uh, things like that. Yeah, you know, I've had I've had the the pleasure of going to to teach firefighters in 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 uh, you know uh, in um, in Japan. But that, that was only you know fire teaching firefighters, so it was no connection to the fire you know fire research. Um, now I want to go back because I want to be, be, be more more hands on too. Um, you start talking about you know fire, and you start you know looking into fire uh, how the div- individual pieces of of you know room and content fire. I want you to talk a little bit about uh, moisture because when I started sort of trying to understand moisture in the air. And also in 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 you know in, in materials you know like wood and so on, but moisture in air because one thing at first I realized was um, because scientists seem to want to make it easier for them so they always omit uh, the moisture content in the air a lot of times in the calculations and on because of course moisture varies and it mucks up the equations, um, so the <laughs> sort of the imp- the implication of that sort of is that the fire service sort of forgot about moisture in the air it was you know sort of like sort of like a non-important thing sort of when you talk about the con what's you know what the air contains most of the times you know moisture is not even mentioned because because it you know it's fell out of the equation somewhere and then it fell out of you know, mental models um when you look at fire dynamics uh of course also at, at suppression when moisture content goes up how would you explain moisture in the air and how it affects fire behavior and, you know, um, concepts like thermal ballast? Uh, I know it's a big question, but like, how would you uh, think about moisture? Moisture, moisture in the air as a, as a gas. Yes. All right. Yes. Not yes. No, not droplets. I'm not mist systems. As I'm talking about gas. gas. Yeah. Right. Because we know that water mist can do a good job, yeah. and then the particles move just like gas. Yeah, the small particles. So, so uh, just the gas of moisture. Uh, you know, fifty percent humidity, eighty percent humidity. Uh, it, it's it's not going to have a big effect on the movement of smoke and air and fire products. However, with higher humidity, everything that can absorb stuff or is a little cooler than the air is gonna cause stuff to condense. So things are going to get wet and absorb moisture. 
Now, in order to burn those items, you have to drive off the moisture first. So it's harder for it, you to heat up those items. And I'm just saying goodbye to somebody. Yeah. I, I'm getting work done on my floor. And, and so moisture in items is going to, you know, slow down ignition and, and uh, flame spread and maybe even burning rate. But what you have to realize is that when you have a wildland fire, you're not burning just the dead wood, you're burning live leaves and trees. And in the leaves with capillary action, you can have almost 100% moisture. In general, wood might absorb 20% moisture, you know, in, in construction wood. Yeah. You know, if it's it's uh, exposed to moisture or high humidity. So uh, you're going to affect how things burn. You're not going to affect the motion of the gases. My opinion. So, yeah, yeah. No, that makes perfect sense to me. And, you know, uh, so you have basically moisture in the air gas. It doesn't make a huge difference toward anything unless, you know, again, the condensation on the surfaces and that wets the materials. Right. Now, right. when you start building up temperature, um, so you're not at 20 degrees anymore in the inlet and so on, and you build up moisture content from the fire, let's say the door is half closed or maybe entirely closed, you start to get con you know, convective feedback. Uh, now you start building moisture content from the burning process, you're releasing moisture, yeah. boiling moisture from the surfaces. Right. How does moisture, when temperatures go up and the con you know, and the, that, how does that affect fire? Well, again, most, you know, you have a lot of excess air in the smoke. Yeah. So uh, it, it doesn't, you know, it changes density a little bit here and there. You got now more carbon dioxide and water vapor, but it's not going to have a, a big effect. No, on, I the mean, it, on the movement of the gases. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, now, will it have no effect? I'm sure it has some effect. But, you know, nuances like that, I don't think have been fully studied. You know, it may look at fire growth in human conditions, but I don't think the effect of uh, water vapor in the air on how smoke might move or what it might do to equipment, you know, because if it can condense on some stuff, it may rust it later. <laughs> No, because right. when 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 I started understanding, sort of <clears throat> like like water mist systems and how they vaporize the steam and how steam, and I would take it to the next level and look at okay, how does it affect combustion at different moisture contents? At some at some point, there's enough moisture in the air to suppress combustion. Yeah, but you see, with the water droplets and water mist. Water has a high heat capacity and takes a lot of energy to vaporize it. So when those water droplets hit a flame, a flame can easily be extinguished. It doesn't take that much water. It's so with those balance. fine particles being sucked right into the heart of the flame, rather than a hose stream, because now it's pervasive, it, it can have an effect. Uh, you know, so the, the, it's really the vaporization of the water that it, it is the main main effect. As you know, in firefighting, that, that's you know, and here's something. I think I said one time we should study how water puts out a fire. And I was told by a manager, everyone knows water puts out a fire. Yeah, it's it's complicated. <laughs> I tried to explain that with a you know article I wrote the other day about you know with the connection between heat release rate and cooling capacity. And I said it, it doesn't. It's, I don't like the because there's a mental model in the fire services as GPM versus BTU. 
um, meaning you know you need a certain amount of GPN gallons per minute to overcome a certain amount of BTU. And I said, no, that that's not true because it depends on where the BTUs are happening or where the water is happening. Because sort of it's implied that everything the system is basically uniform. You, you know, water goes everywhere, and you spray it. The the, the energy release is being released everywhere at the same time, which is of course not true. If you have a fire. You know, typically, you know, the flashover, you have the fire, basic flames at the vent point, then you have, you know, no basic, no flames in the in where the fire started. If you put some water, the fire started, uh, it's not going to take a lot of water to put it out, even though you have a huge amount of heat released being released by the vent point, for instance. Um, and I think that those kind of sort of mental models about, you know, where does the water go? Uh, in relationship to, for instance, heat release rate, those 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 are definitely not studied or explained well. I'll, I'll tell you something more basic and cleaner: the mechanics of a hose stream. Yeah. You fire a hose. How long will it really go? How far will it go? When will it start to break up? When will the stream maintain its? You know, how long will the stream? Yeah. That, that hasn't been studied, yet one of my colleagues at Maryland did study that at a PhD level, but his student kind of fumbled the ball in the end, but he had all the data and all the background, but then that guy went off and got a different jump. And that, if, if you know about host streams, they have little formulas to say how far it goes, yeah. but there's no science behind it. No, they're exper that's experimental, basic. yeah. It's a basic, you know, you would think yeah. if you're, how do I design a better hose? Yeah. How do I specify the hose? Um, and I know people have argued over this. Do you get a straight stream or do you get a, a broad spray with yeah. finer particles? Which is the best way to put it out, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's a huge debate still ongoing. Huge debates. Yes. Now you know why the fire program at NIST died. Yeah. Because and, they had firefighters there and they didn't they didn't see, you know, you know, it, it was anyway. Uh no, yeah, uh, yeah. trust me, I know the political problem. Uh, the political yeah, problem. Yeah, it's yeah. a culture thing, you know. Uh, you know, like I guess it's the old saying that you know everybody's found their own map to to the you know, treasure island, and and because they found and, that and, map, and were born to fight with other firefighters. Yeah, yeah, right? it, it is. Yeah, but I, I think one of the blame. Uh, for this is also again the lack of of connection between fire science and fire service. There's been so little of that connection being made. Um, so the fire service has the fire science has have, the fire science industry hasn't been really good at explaining how fire works in basic terms, and the fire service hasn't been trying to listen. It, you know, if you take it broadly. Yeah, you have to have some wise people involved. Uh, it is a hard sell, but to me, when the fire service in general realizes that it should be responsible for fire prevention and the regulations that connect to it, the whole field of fire science and engineering will enlarge. Once the fire service says, that that should be a big part of our responsibility instead of kicking it off to regulators who are not connected to the fire service to nfpa who works off volunteers and people with special interests even though if they try to do good they do make a lot of money uh and it should really be like in the u.s Everything is local. In Sweden, you, I think you have a federal fire service, right? It, I mean, it doesn't, it, it's not state or city oriented, isn't it more, there's a higher level? Uh, no, yes and no. Uh, no, the fire service is, is municipal, but all the regulations and everything is national. So everyone, and, and all the education for firefighters, it's national. So 
So it's it, you know it's because all the regulations, because all the training, and because all the rules, uh, and and you know goes for fire prevention and for operational. It, it's just they're all the same. It's just basically management that on on a local level, you know. Um, yeah, um, but, but it, rules are national. Yes, right. Yes, all those things. Are not national. in the U.S. No, not in the U.S. And here's another thing. How many criminal justice programs do you know? Are they as active as they are in the U.S.? Almost every university has a criminal justice program to make police learn more. How many comparable programs are there for the fire service? I don't you know, should but, be jealous yeah. and envious of the police. Why do they get to have this degree program yeah. in criminal? justice it, yeah is that is that does that occur in sweden too uh i mean sweden uh, sweden is a little bit different to most countries since we it since the 70s maybe even earlier uh the fire protection engineering program has always had one foot in the fire service meaning that a lot of the fire protection engineers um uh, end up as senior officers in the fire service, which means that there's been a connection between the fire protection side and the and the fire operational side because it's cross-contaminated. Um, now, I would like to see... But, but, but you have criminal justice programs like we do in the US? I don't know. I, don't, I know it, too little about the police in Sweden, so I, wouldn't, I couldn't okay, make so, comparisons. So, so maybe it's just a phenomenon in the US. Yeah. But the police have these criminal justice programs. In almost every university, there's a criminal justice program. Okay. And they're to educate better police. I, police is national in Sweden, too. I, so I know I, I know too little about the police, but I, and, I mean... And, and it, see, in police, they're local. Yeah, but, which but is a big have, difference. They yeah. have this... Edu when the ATF came... We connected and we went to criminal justice and we want to put a component of fire investigation into their program. They even balked at it okay. because it wasn't their culture. Okay. The people that teach that are all people from law enforcement side. Okay. So, yeah, so I know. why can't the fire service, you know, me you know, measure up to the same activity level well i think i mean the, uh, yeah i totally agree but i know it's that in america it, yeah in america it is uh i know there's a big culture of of it being a blue collar job and they want to maintain it a blue collar job um you know it's there there's there is definitely a you know strains of culture in america which looks down on science as being um you know it's just it's just theories we 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 put out fires with experience. We put out fires with you know hard work, um, and of course that. I, and then mo most countries have those strains of culture too, and, and of course there is a mix because you need you need you need hard work and blue collar doers. You can't just think out the fire, um, but you need you need you need of course base it on solid understanding of what fire does. And I again going to Sweden, I'm a bit I'm a bit. Um, um, of course, colored by this system because we've for so long have fire protection engineers coming into the system. So it has been, um, it has been more in, 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 in introduced to the science of fire, of, of fire. What I would like to see this Sweden would be, the, would be the opposite also. I think the fire protection program has too little firefighters in them because firefighters uh, at least good fire instructors are very good at, you know, what does it all mean in the end when you put the equations on <laughs> in the end? Right. How does it fit into, uh, you know, what actually happens at a fire? Because what, what a lot of fire instructors and good firefighters develop over time is, of course, this, this uh, you know, basically, lack of a better word, gut feeling of how fire behaves. They, you know, they, you know, if, if that happens, this will happen because you develop that sort of mental model of of what's going to happen, and they can go to 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 fire protection in course, but that doesn't make sense. You know, what 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 the FDS is showing you doesn't make sense. It, it wouldn't behave like that. There has to be an integration. 
Yes, but I don't think I, I don't think that's that exists at all. Like, look, look at what engineering has done for medicine. Yeah, you go to any doctor's office or hospital, and you see all these measuring devices and artificial limbs, and that all came from engineering. Yeah, the doctors didn't do it. Yeah, no, definitely so not. The, the fire service needs an integration of science. And engineering in in Sweden is the fire service responsible for regulations? Uh, no, well, indirectly because it's the it's the govern it's the organ it, it's the um, the agency the go the national agency that re- that dictates what the fire service should do. They also dictate and and be you know what the rules are for fire fire, fire prevention. So in that sense, yes, and the fire service. But- are responsible do for doing do, do fire service people work in fire prevention absolutely absolutely oh, so, so, so yeah so so every fire service if you're a firefighter in the swedish fire department you you do you do at least you do public you know education and all the fire protection engineers that work within the fire service they do they you do and also firefighters for that matter they do on various levels building inspections and you know you know make sure that they operate towards code and so on so they're just checking off do they follow the code uh, they're not just looking at why do we have that code uh not the fire service i would say but I, the fire service of course some of them work also for the agency national agency at you know different projects is looking at you know of course code um so it, there would be people from the fire service uh when new code are implemented or or you know they, they would be people from the fire service that look at the code and see does it make sense for instance so that it wouldn't be a separate thing that no one from the fire service you know when there's new codes being dropped for instance um but a lot of sweden is performance based uh and that has been which was a push that didn't have anything to fire service. It was sort of like the general thing, like the Reagan, you're like, we want less, less code. We want less code. So we want more performance based. That was generally for society. Um, and one thing I think different people have different opinions about this, but when we went from code to performance based, there was definitely a drop in fire safety. Uh, and some argued it has started to go up again because the fire service had to get better at at you know doing uh, inspections and make sure that the 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 performance based you know uh, decisions that were made actually made sense um and so if it got better or worse it depends on who you ask i guess <laughs> y- y- yes do you, do you know <clears throat> Performance-based codes really started in Japan, and they were tweaked and promoted through Australia. Okay. Uh, and then it propagated around the world that we should use engineering to design better fire safety. But in Japan, the way it's done is that they have tiers. So they have basic rules, you know, thou shall do this and that. And then move up. Well, maybe you have a little flexibility. And now you go up here and now you need to analyze the smoke movement in your building. Yeah. Well, how do you do that? Well, just find an engineer and do it. Not in Japan. You use this computer code that we sanctify that will do the fire, the smoke movement in the building, or you use an equivalent. So they specify the methodology that the performance code people should use. And they have to certify that they used it. That's not done in performance-based codes now. And you could see that if you look at engineering, if you design a boiler or a pressure vessel, there, there are formulas that you have to use to design that with a factor of safety. Yeah. And that's part of the code. We don't have that in fire. So when you say performance-based code, it's like, 
okay, here's your gun. Go out and shoot whatever you want as long as you kill bad people. Yeah. Yeah, though, that, yeah that sounds very, you know, similar to what I understand um, yeah. the codes are. It, it, it is a... So it, it's a con in Sweden. I would say it's a it's a battle between sort of the fire the fire engine, the fire engineers that work for the private sector and draw buildings, which has the always the you know um, the battle against the, the 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 building contractors who want to build cheap buildings, and they hire a fire engineer to design a building that uh, are as you know cheap as possible and still uh, you know is deemed fire safe. So the fire engineers will try to make it's called, you know, you know, trade-offs basically in Sweden. So if you do let's say you do a longer distance to uh an emergency exit, but then if you clad it in some materials that give out less smoke, that's a trade-off sort of. And there's a whole bunch of trade-offs and they make yeah. those and they even and then, structures they say if you have sprinklers you yes. can back from the structural protection. Yeah, all, all those okay. kind of trade-offs uh, are made constantly. But if the sprinkler, sprinkler system fails, and now you got jump to the fully developed fire, that structure that is now only protected for one hour will see a two-hour fire. Yeah. No, I mean... So, so they're, they're at opposite ends. The strength sprinklers for the early fire, the protection is for the late fire. Yeah. No, they're I, saying you never get the late fire. <laughs> yeah, and in Sweden, all you buildings. Know in the World Trade Center, there were no sprinklers in the original design. Okay. Do you know that uh, one building fell down in about fifty minutes, and the other building fell down in a hundred minutes? Yeah. Do you know the difference in the fire protection on the trusses? No, I, no, I haven't looked into it. Was that. a factor of two between those two floors. Yeah, because because, of... because the first amount that they put on in 1965 was not according to code. Okay. They made it up, and in 1990 they found out that it was wrong according to UL systems. Yeah. So they started to fix it. That's why one area in one building had double the insulation than the other building. Now, that might explain why it fell down in half yeah. the time. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, sure. That 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 would make sense in that sense. Uh, I am the <laughs> what what and, I've started to appreciate. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, uh, I started to appreciate. Uh, again, I don't do fire prevention. That's what I, you know, I train firefighters. But yeah. what I started, of course, I realized when I started traveling the world, of course, is that if you're how how important it is that the fire service is a part of the, of course, uh, the entire system of 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 responding to fires. If you take away the fire prevention side, but if you don't understand fire prevention as as an operational side, you 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 don't know how to to work with the building. Of course, uh, just one example in Sweden, we have buildings that are have to support um, you know snow loads. That has indirectly made our buildings, even though they are single family houses, made them sturdy, which indirectly affected the fire service because typically, you know, single family houses don't collapse in Sweden. It's a huge difference going to a warm area, which have basically the same, maybe it's the same fire codes, but they don't have snow, and, and all of a sudden buildings collapse. And all those you know, all those you know regulations and so on and and environmental factors and cultures and everything play a part in how the fire service of course can operate and should operate in that but that did not understand that for a very long time when i start traveling how, how much that context plays a plays a role now imagine if somebody said even in sweden this agency up here we're we're going to get rid of that, and the agency that covers the fire service, you firefighters are going to be totally responsible for the codes and prevention. 
Yeah, it would now, be a huge difference. Now somebody will have to go hire some engineers, and then they will find that maybe, and, and when you start questioning why we have this code or that code, and you can't trace it back even to a rational document, you say, how could I base my decision on that thing that you can't even tell me where it came from. I could give you an example of something that's entirely stupid in Sweden, at least from my perspective. So we had, so if you're going to build up to eight floors, you only need one staircase, which is a lot of the same in some countries, because, because in, in the codes basically said, because you need two, two escape routes, and it specified that the fire service will provide the second one. So if there's a ladder truck in the city, you can build up to eight floors without with just one staircase. Uh, but that's what's been. It's then it said, okay, so you're relying all all the evacuation here on that the ladder truck in that city is operational and works, and there's no technical you know problems with it, which we all know that ladder trucks <laughs> always have. Ladder trucks are horribly. Uh, the mo at least the modern ones, because there's gadgets and widgets and sensors everywhere, and they usually break down uh, on and off. So we have a, a prevention system that says we're gonna, you know, the safety is is you know part of it is up to the fire service, and basically the fire service today says we can't promise that we can't promise that there always will be a ladder truck to help people out of the of the window at eight floors up. Um, but it's too expensive to change it. So the fire service, nobody listens to the firefighters saying that. It's just la, 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 la. It's too expensive to fix that. You know, we would have to rebuild <laughs> ungodly amount of houses. So we just keep on doing that. But if the fire service, of course, would get to decide that, saying that, well, you can't build up above three floors <clears throat> uh, unless you build two staircases because we can't provide that service. We can't, we can't promise that. That would make, that would, be it change if the fire service could make that decision when we started talking about the early days of fire research in the u.s i said there was a program from the national science foundation for national needs yeah. and some of that related to the fire service and one of the things that students designed and it worked they demonstrated it was a flexible tube that a person could jump in and slowly migrate down to the floor in safety, yeah. escaping from a fire at a high place. Yeah. So you would have these tubes available and people could jump into them and, and they would slowly, you know, come down. Um, and that was a component. And you could see that's kind of a little bit crazy idea or novel. You would really have to convince people <laughs> that it worked, you know, but people take slides from airplanes. Yeah. And uh, they know that if there's a fire in the airplane, they better get out really fast. And they're not going to jump, you know, 50 feet to the ground. So, yeah. yeah so any anyway. I hope maybe not in my life, but in your life, you will see things like that happening. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I hope, I, yeah, I hope so too. But but it is, uh, it does. The economy is not looking better. So in in Sweden, it's like most countries. It's 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 deemed too expensive to build. There's a housing shortage, um, and the if if anything, I think the push from politicians will be we need to make it cheaper to build. And that means that means you know stripping out of way codes. Uh, uh, I guess the reality is that there's too few fires um, to make the news, so it's not a big enough problem for people to be engaged in. Now that again, I don't want to be it's depressed. A, it's, about an in, it's an attitude problem. Yeah. In the '60s, a lot of people got conscious of safety and. The public demanded it. They wanted a safer car. They wanted, you know, 
the fire service said, hey, fire is growing too rapidly now, we need to do something. So, but today, uh, I think, you know, we could say the planet is dying. We don't care. Yeah, it, it, does, it doesn't fit the economical model of my life right now to pay more for gas, for instance. Um, it, 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 it is um, trying to connect it back to, to, to the fire service. And, yeah, you know, I'm, the I'm fire. sorry. <laughs> but, but it's um, what I think, you know, if you look at fire research today, now you're, re, you know, you're retired, but you're still sort of engaged, which is great. <laughs> I hate to see all you know that much knowledge being lost. Um, um, but if you look at fire research now, um, where do you think if you if 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 the goal is let's let's narrow it down a little bit. Let, let's say if the goal is to get better firefighters, which is sort of my again, where do you think fire? Where do you think fire research has to go? Where do you think the gaps are to make operational firefighting better? Do you have any opinion? Well, when I started, we didn't even have a book in in the subject, all right? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so academic-wise, educational-wise, things have grown enormously since 1970. Oh, for sure. Uh, and this is around the world. There are people interested like yourselves now more in the science of fire than ever before. Uh, in China, with its big population compared to Sweden, you have two universities doing fire. Yeah. But China, they have one program at a university that has something like 50 professors doing fire and 300 graduate students. But fire research is distributed over China. So you may find it in about 2,000 or more universities. Yeah, that's a, that's Japan a different, still, different scale. <laughs> Japan is still active in fire. Yeah. And they have maybe uh, a half dozen of universities that are active in fire and two big laboratories that are still active in, in, in fire. But in the US, we have some engineering technology programs, but on a graduate level, there's only a couple of programs for fire. And uh, the, the agencies like NIST, who used to promote this, is atrophied. Yeah. UL is the brightest thing on the horizon. Yeah. So would you are you are you pessimistic about the development of fire research overall or just in the US? I'm I'm encouraged by the propagation of education all around the world. So there are more many more people sensitive to this and reading the literature uh and they will make it grow uh at the same time i think it has to grow into the regulations and how you do performance based codes uh with maybe better scrutiny and uh, how it should invade the fire service to make the fire service realize that it's not just a blue collar job, but th there's things that they have to learn and grow and rely on science and engineering. Maybe not everyone in the fire service, but there needs to be a, a, a critical mass to make them more sensitive and more knowledgeable. So I think that's a really important key. Will fire research keep going? Yes, academically, and they'll find jobs. But I think when the fire service embraces it for whatever reason that makes them do it, I think that will change the whole complexion of this. Because then, then you will have in your profession, you need to understand this, not just fight it and yeah. polish the brass. 
you know, I'm not, I'm not de de denigrating what you guys do because you put your, you know, going into a fire, you put your life on the line. So, but you, you need better tools, better knowledge, uh, better enrichment, so you can benefit from, you know, what humanity has learned and not just be doing the same thing you did, you know, like you did it 100 years ago or more. How do you think we can encourage, overall, I think encourage that bridge between science and, and firefighting? I think there needs to be a, an awakening somehow. In the U.S., it was people said, hey, you need better safety. So we studied it. But that wouldn't, like you said, economically, that wouldn't fly today because we can't even study global warming properly or it, it, embrace it as it's a legitimate need. So if people said, hey, we better do fire bit better, they'll say, well, we don't have fires that often. Yeah, no, it's, and, it's, it's a. It's, and, and, and it's true. It's true. Um, no, so, I, someone has to fight it, of course. But it, you know, it's 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 a um, it's um, as a as a as a small cog in, in a in a very big machine. <laughs> it's of course yes. to, to. If you look at the books and uh, items that are documented on regulations, it's a lot to learn. And if you say you got to follow these rules, I got to learn a lot about the rules. But then if you say, why do we have these rules? And are these the most cost effective or not? That's not coming into the picture. And why? Shouldn't things be done more efficiently? Maybe we'd even save money in the long run. I, 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 I guess, I mean, look at me when I... When I started, I have a so I, I'm I'm very curious as a person, but that is one of my my key pieces when I teach. I I want to spark curiosity because I realized when I became a, became a firefighter, Sweden had a very like most countries a very strong culture about we are the best in the world when it comes to firefighting, and because we're the best in the world, we don't have to learn from anyone else. I mean, it's not as explicit, but that is implicit that what it means hey. <laughs> it's it's stupid Fire yes yes in the u.s feel the same way yes but they it's feel basically the same way about the next city over yeah. it doesn't it, it's not national yeah but no one yeah you you know yeah no i but that is why because when i read all the textbooks in swedish sort of the, the textbooks for firefighting in swedish i thought i i maxed out I was done. I was finished. There was, there was no need to be curious about anything else because I read all the books and they said how it works and how fire works and all the things. It wasn't until I started almost accidentally looking over the horizon and being exposed to books that said maybe the same thing but in a different way or said something that was counterintuitive to what I believed. That was the first sort of the 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 thing that got me interested in becoming sort of a fire nerd and you know wanting to understand really what happens. And I think that the one of the big pieces, at least from a fire service side, is that there is this belief that we sort of figured out, we know what we need to know, so there's no need really to go any further. Um, so my pet piece has always been curiosity. When I teach, I try not to sound like I understand it all. I try not to convey that if you understand this, this is the truth. Like there's a deep, there's always another layer on the onion. If you peel away that, it started to unravel again and you'd make new mental models and you peel away those mental models, it start to unravel again. You need to create new ones. Um, and, I, and and that has been one of the biggest things for me, at least, to find that that we need to somehow make the knowledge usable, which means that it has to be sound enough and simple enough to be used, but also 
complex enough to spark curiosity to take it one step further. And I think that's a very hard balance because when I meet fire instructors, some say, well, I, I want to build competent firefighters that are, you know, uh, confident. And that means give them the knowledge and so that then they believe they are good enough to do it. Meaning they, they're not curious anymore because they think they got it. I got this. I'm going to run in and I'm going to spray water. But you don't want to have insecure firefighters go like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Fire is super complex. Yes, yes. I, I can't get I, in I there. And no, finding it, that no, balance but, is pretty hard. But look, practicing as a firefighter for many, many years, they absorb a lot of skills. Yeah. And they, those skills are empirical knowledge of how fire behaves. So it's not like they're not educated. Same thing with fire investigators. They learn the same way. But when they couple it with some scientific tools, then it, 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 it expands their, their world. I've seen that you know, grow with fire investigators, but I haven't seen that grow among firefighters. Uh, no, I think that, I mean there is a there is a some good trends out there, but if you look at how many, if you look at how many firefighters there are, for instance, in America, like one point three million or something, the vast vast majority has never heard about UL. For instance, they have never read or looked at the studies, even though they're excellent e-learning programs and videos. It's highly engaging. Yes, if the U.S. adopted things on a national level, they would be forced to make this happen. I, it, it, but, but we're. <laughs> yeah, no, it definitely a problem. I heard someone said, but that was probably 10 years ago, it said that the things that's gonna make the American Fire Service change are lawsuits. When firefighters get injured or die, and the lawsuit looks at why are you doing something that doesn't correlate towards the latest science, for instance, what the UL is doing. I heard someone say that that was the thing that's going to make the majority of the fire service change, the fear of lawsuits. But I don't know if that's true. It sounds horrible uh, that that's if that's the case. Uh, and I don't know you, even though that it would work because, you know, how would you know about the lawsuit if you have such a fractured system? Yeah, well, I mean, you, you, you have a lot of um, um, lawsuit potential in the fire service. If people are not fully hydrated, they could really die in a fire situation. Yeah, uh, by being at the scene of a fire and mopping up with all that volatile and dust and soot particles coming into your lungs. Where you say, I don't need this breathing apparatus anymore. What long term effect has would that yeah. is that having on you? Just like all the responders in the World Trade Center breathing in that dust yeah. and the burning underground fires for, that went on for weeks and weeks. Yeah. We know what happened. So you're subjected to stuff that it's probably you, you know you can do a better job if somehow people educated you on what's going on oh for sure uh, i mean that's not it but again again, again it's, it's just hard <laughs> fire it is just, hard <laughs> it, 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 yes but i mean what can i say i mean yes society is maybe not ready for this but Anyway, the knowledge base has expanded. Yeah, there's absolutely. a SFP handbook on, you know, of, of, that that has science in it. Yeah, uh, the Japanese developed one before them. Uh, the, these these documents, like you're reading them, they're all they're all out there. So it, it's a it's a slow growth phase. But again, I, I my wish is that the fire service engaged with science and engineering, not just at the entry top level, but just like 
law enforcement people have to learn all about, you know, the science behind law enforcement and go to criminal justice. Firefighters should have something like that too. No, I fully agree. And uh, hopefully we can get closer to that. Um, it's uh, There's a lot of good things happening. Unfortunately, a lot of bad things happening too, and lot, lots with, with cuts in, in money. Uh, in the financial times, it's not getting better. Um, but there's a, I, I sense a huge grassroots movement in the fire service directed towards, we sort of have peaked over the horizon and we are not as good as we think we were. And that is sort of a huge step in the right direction yeah. of, of realizing yeah. that we need to look at the science more. Yeah. We need to look at what our neighbors are doing. Um, it's taken longer than I wished, uh, but at least it's starting to happen. I think. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna release you now, and I need to go to bed. Basically, uh, also uh, got oh, a job. Is, what time is it for you over it's, there? It's uh, eleven o'clock in the in, in the evening at night. Oh, or, I'm sorry. Oh no, no, on. not at all. That I, I'm usually up this hour, but I need to go out. I'm building a new fire training facility tomorrow. I'm out welding and stuff like that on my local fire department. Uh, so we're you know for doing for teaching uh, you know about science and, and fire fire. Um, so I have a good job tomorrow. Can I leave you with one thought that we didn't oh, touch absolutely. on? We absolutely. Briefly on scale models. Yes. Uh, there was a study done, and I did it with the ATF lab people and an ATF agent on scale modeling. And uh, it it spurned a, a guy, Mark Campbell. He's He died early, a young man. But he was doing countless scale modeling tests, comparing them to full-scale tests, in which the contents were not some idealized fuel. But they were a bed, a sofa, et cetera. Okay. And when you do scale modeling, like you said, there's a lot of variables. Which ones do you ignore? And which ones do you keep? And so we we uncovered a, a, a technique, and Mark Campbell tried it, and he did countless tests. And uh, if you make little windows in these scale models, you can really, really learn a lot. So I don't know if in your teaching you use any scale models with real furniture, but if you want to, if you haven't, I would suggest you might look at that. And there's a there's a report that we put together on scale modeling. And if you're interested, send me an email and I'll try to dig it out i might probably read it but because i tried to read all of them uh maybe 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 i, I would love to see if you can send it if i read it uh it was I, a one for the national institutes of justice okay no which maybe, has, yeah which has a fire which which does fire research imagine that the national institutes yeah. of justice no i that may not have, they may not have read that one because I've read a lot about you know how to scale openings towards how to scale the compartment. You have to have keep the openings. The, uh, the ATF agent was adept at making furniture. Yeah. So he made little furniture, but we had to decide what we kept and what we didn't yeah. keep. So we burned the same materials as the full scale. That, that no that that and it, and that it, report and I haven't tra read. It tracked. Nice. Well, how how big was the model? How big were the models? We, we, sort of. We did quarter scale because if you get too small, yeah, the radiation gets so too close. You have a, yeah. a two meter tall room. You know, you you would want to bring it down to uh, what a half a meter. Half a meter, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah, like you said, if you get too small, um, both time yeah, you, and you don't and get lamin don't get turbulent flow and yeah. you know it's no i mean and and what i've learned sort of both from experience and reading is that you you have to really be careful when you build models you can build a model to teach a specific thing uh but it's very easy to start using the model for something else and it doesn't react like real life because <clears throat> a lot of models 
that are built for the fire service for training and the models are, are again built to show a specific thing a certain flow or a, you know how development of a single room fire and if you start to use it at something else you get these skewed results it's like some some people start doing basically doing research in them then that's that's uh not not research research but research on a on a firefighter scale meaning that what see what what happens if we do this and you you kind of provoke a result by the fire that doesn't match reality um but models which sort of you know that they represent reality and use them that i think are one of the most the most powerful tools we have for understanding fire um, yeah well we just de- we design airplanes using the model yeah no I, and i think because one thing that that models do of course they're much cheaper to do in the full scale and so on that's one of the aspects of sort of but with the models you can see from different sides what happens and get a full understanding of it in full scale when you do full scale fire training which a lot of people love and of course i like it too for a lot of reasons but you only get a lot of times one perspective for instance what happens in the entry position because i can't see what happens on the back side in that door that window is open but in the model i can look at different flows different openings and i can see how it relates i, I do something here and it happens fairly quick also so it's easier to connect the action with the outcome in full life you open a door and something doesn't happen until half a minute one minute two minutes it's very hard to make the connection to see that door was actually the reason that fire started picking up on the second floor. If you, if you use a scale model for fire, as I'm yeah. telling you, uh, time changes, so things happen faster. Yeah. Uh, if you're interested, uh, send me a, a reminder, and I'll yeah, I would love to read that one. Yes. Yeah, because you so, know sometimes I build, but that's not for sort of fire bait. This sort of but just for visualizing. And sometimes you build some small models. and even, and I I can tell you that if you do the same thing full scale, you will see a remarkable similarity. Cool, I love it. I'm uh, I'm right. um, actually now when I'm at the training field building that fire facility, I'm building also a a new model in in aluminum. <laughs> Because it's a reusable model, scale model, and I'm building an aluminum to be able to travel more, and then I'm experimenting with some new features. So I hope maybe I'll build some small models also of furniture that can be easily replaced with sort of a sheet or something that you have a base and you can mm-hmm. put a sheet on it so that you get this repeatability, but with low costs of, of making every every time you build it or remodel it because uh, you know with train fire training you're doing it so many times that you know just the construction of it is is uh expensive in the long run um you know the point of aluminum what you know the melting temperature of aluminum oh it's very low but i use a ceramic insulation to to shield the aluminum at the places that i need to okay all right yeah, so I use uh, you know the high temperature ceramics to to protect the aluminum that you know. Uh, but yes, uh, because I built it in steel, but steel is very Don't heavy. That silica dust. It's a it, that silica is biodegradable. Um, it, they say it's biodegradable, but every time we use the model, we're in BA also. So um, yeah, breathe the silica dust. Yeah, when you cut up that stuff. Yeah, whatever you're using. Yeah, no. Uh, when I when I use the model and build the model, I use a you know uh, 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 a force fed particle um, uh, filter mask. Uh, so I, yeah, I try. I do try to protect myself. So I, you know, thank you for telling me. Um, uh, but it is it is it is to make things last is a science of itself when you do fire training like fire facilities. That's that's uh, that's a science by itself. Where, the, where there's like no science of building training facilities. That's all. So we, we froze. So oh, sorry. Maybe it's trying to help us. It's not going to work anymore. Yeah. No, I, I'm yeah. super grateful, James. Uh, I have a lot of new thoughts in my head and I would love to follow up on some time when I gather more questions. Uh, I find it so inspiring to talk to you uh, about both the history, but also right the, the current state of right now. Uh, I like that you are uh, you're a critical person, <laughs> and you're not really afraid to tell you what people think. The the academics are so afraid 
is my my thought. They're super afraid of the reputation, super afraid to to criticize anyone else. They're super afraid of of, of stepping out of their tiny tiny field of expertise um so they become sort of useless sometimes because they don't say anything besides like a very specific thing they can say something and that makes it really hard to use it and you don't seem to be as afraid i get in trouble sometimes for <laughs> some of that well that's a that's that that's actually a good thing if you if you don't get in trouble for people think you say you're not pushing yeah. the limits anywhere yeah. I'm grateful, James, uh, Jim, Dr. Q, uh, and I hope you have a great day. You, you too, Lars. Uh, yeah. I enjoyed the uh, discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Keep working. I will.